Hello, health champions. Today, we're going to talk about the top 10 things you must never do if you want to lose belly fat. Or to put it another way, if you really love your belly fat and you want to hold on to it, keep it and grow it, then you want to make sure to do every single thing on this list. Well, we're going to start a countdown and they're not in any particular order of importance. I've kind of grouped them by function instead so you can see the logic of this. So if you want to lose belly fat, you should never be on a high sugar diet. And when we talk about that, we need to understand the two types of belly fat. One is subcutaneous and the other is called visceral. And here's what that looks like and what it means. So first we have the fat that you can grab. If you pinch your fat, then you're going to grab the subcutaneous fat. But then there is a layer of muscle and that separates the subcutaneous from the visceral. And visceral is what sits inside the muscle and that mixes up with your organs. And why does that matter? Well, visceral fat is often known as the bad fat or the dangerous fat because it's associated with most degenerative disease. When we talk about heart disease and diabetes and stroke and so forth, it is the visceral fat that matters. And it's not because the visceral fat is bad in itself, it's because of the hormones that led to the visceral fat being there. So the two hormones are insulin and cortisol. And insulin is a hormone that is fat storing in general, whenever you eat something, the excess calories, the excess energy gets deposited as fat and insulin is the hormone that is responsible for that. But cortisol is a stress hormone. So when we have a combination of high insulin, high cortisol, now that is more likely to lead to visceral fat, which sits around the midsection, also known as an apple-shaped body. So when we have subcutaneous fat, that's mostly insulin, where the body is just trying to put on and preserve the extra energy for some future use. But the visceral fat also has a component of stress. And stress is one of the most devastating things that we can have. And we'll talk a little bit more about that also. Also important for visceral fat is a fatty liver because that's one of the organs in the abdominal cavity. And non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is caused by fructose. And of course, fructose is 50% of sugar. And this is why you never want to be on a high sugar diet. And it doesn't matter if it is white table sugar, if it's honey, if it's agave, if it's high fructose corn syrup, any of those is going to have approximately 50% or maybe a little more than 50% fructose in it. And that quickly overwhelms the liver because this fructose turns into the excess, turns into fat, it infiltrates the liver and then this liver fat spreads into the surrounding tissues and infiltrates the rest of the organs to create all this visceral fat. And on that note, you also want to avoid high carbs. Even though they're not as likely to cause this problem as fructose, once you have the problem, high carb diet is really going to make it difficult for you to reverse this. And you also never want to drink excess alcohol. And it's just like sugar. It's a very natural substance. Your body knows how to break it down, but it's the excess that overwhelms the capacity of your organs. So the number one cause today of a fatty liver is sugar and fructose. But the second one, of course, is a traditional fatty liver, which is excess alcohol. So one or two drinks some days is usually not going to be an issue. But when you start having three or four or five or six drinks, every day, then that can lead to a fatty liver, an alcoholic fatty liver. And if you want to lose belly fat, you should never eat all day. We hear so often that we should eat small meals frequently throughout the day, early in the morning, late at night, but that's not how it works for most people. And the reason is for the hormone insulin. 
So every time you eat something, you spike a little bit of insulin, you stimulate a little release of insulin. And if you eat frequent meals, now you stimulate frequent insulin spikes. So here's what that looks like. When the body likes to keep things, the blood sugar in a very, very narrow range. So every time that you eat a little bit, your blood sugar rises and the body responds with an insulin spike to bring that blood sugar back down into a safe range. And that's not supposed to happen all day long. And if you do that all day long, now your insulin is going to keep going up and down, up and down, up and down all day long. And it never has a chance to really get into a normal range or to lower. And the more frequently you do this, if you do this month after month, year after year, then that baseline for insulin is going to get higher and higher and higher. And that's what insulin resistance is. So the way to turn this around is instead to eat small carb, low carb meals, not to restrict calories. You're probably going to eat more calories per meal, but they're going to be lower carb, more protein, fat, and fiber. So now your glucose spikes are going to be much smaller and slower. And then your corresponding insulin is also going to be much lower. So then you allow that insulin to drop back down and then you eat again and then you allow it to drop back down. But now if you allow, let's say that you eat your last meal at 6 p.m. but you don't eat again until the next day maybe at noon. Now you have 18 hours with no further stimulation of insulin which allows that insulin to drop. And this is why you don't want to eat all day long. And the other part to that equation is that the higher the carb content, the higher the insulin spike. Type 1 diabetics know this. You eat so many carbs, you have to take so much insulin. So for every unit of carbohydrate you eat, you have to increase that insulin correspondingly. So when you eat a lot of carbs, then you stimulate more insulin. When you eat frequent meals, high carbohydrate, now you have frequent high insulin spikes. And this is where you're going to drive your baseline up over time. And why does that matter even more than for the reasons we talked about? Because chronically high insulin makes you hungry. High levels of insulin prevents fat burning and it promotes fat storing. So that means high insulin is going to push all the fat you have into the cell and you're supposed to be able to draw from that fat when you get hungry. But if the insulin is high, you can't get to it. There's too much insulin pushing it into the fat cell. So now your body says, well, I guess there is no fat around for me to pull from. So let's eat some more. And what's the fastest source of energy is more carbohydrates. So that's where you create this vicious cycle of eating more and more carbohydrates in order to feel good. Also, you never want to use artificial sweeteners. So when you hear about these things, they tell you that you can lose weight with artificial sweeteners because they have zero calories. That sounds like a good idea. If you don't put any calories in, then you should be able to lose weight, right? Unfortunately, that's not how it works. Instead, what they find is that most people, the more artificial sweeteners people use, the more they gain weight. And even though they have zero calories, they do other things. They tend to confuse the messages in the body. So when you eat something sweet, your body thinks it's getting calories. And if it doesn't, it's going to try to compensate some other way. So again, you get more cravings, more hunger. You maintain your sweet tooth. And in the end, people end up gaining more weight. But that's not the only problem with these because they're also mostly related or developed from pesticides. So things like aspartame and sucralose and acesulfame K or acesulfame potassium, 
These are the three big ones that are being used primarily today. An older one is saccharin, not used so much anymore. But these are pesticides. They are toxic chemicals. They are neurotoxins. And as soon as I said that, someone's going to leave a comment and said, well, there is not enough research to prove that they're bad. And my point here is that when you've spent 20, 30 years studying natural health and holistic health and how the body works and what makes people sick, you realize that we don't need research to find out if foreign chemicals are bad for the body. There is plenty of research on some and they're getting more and more, but we don't even have to get research because foreign chemicals in the body is just not a good idea. And you never want to eat excess vegetable oils. And what is a vegetable oil, first of all? Well, there's no such thing. Do they squeeze the oil from cabbage or broccoli or Brussels sprouts? No, they get the oil from seeds and legumes and grains. And what they really mean is that it's a plant oil or a non animal sourced oil, but vegetables sounded so good. So let's call it vegetable oil. But the problem here is that these seeds and grains and legumes are very, very high in omega sixes. When taken in excess, they promote inflammatory pathways. So we're ideally supposed to get about a one to one ratio of omega three to omega six. But when we eat a modern diet with grain fed meat and tons of these plant oils in our food, we can get as much as a 20 to one ratio between omega six and omega threes. And that creates inflammation. That's a bad thing. But more than that, these seeds and legumes and grains are not very high in oil. So they have to use high pressure, high heat, and even chemical solvents to get that oil out of there. And now that leaves chemical residue, such as acetone, for example. That's not something that we want to consume. And then the high heat and pressure will oxidize these fats. So they destroy the fats even before we eat them, which leads to free radicals. So these oils, you don't have to be absolutely paranoid. If you have a little squeeze of mayonnaise once in a while, that's not an excess, but you don't want to get these as part of your regular food supply and realize that all fast food, all restaurants, all processed foods contain pretty much nothing but these oils that we're talking about. And the reason that we got so confused and got things so backwards is that there are some polyunsaturated fatty acids. So these omega-6s, these plant oils, they're usually very high in polyunsaturated fats. And there are some very good polyunsaturates called EPA and DHA. And those are the ones that we get from fish oil and the body uses them for structural components in your brain and in your nerves. So your nervous system depends on these, especially the DHA for its proper function. So now we hear that, well, these polyunsaturated fats are so good for us. They're so essential. We can't have a functioning brain without them. Then polyunsaturated must be better. So then we jump to the conclusion that these polyunsaturated fatty acids should be the way that we get fuel. That if they're good for structural components, then they must be good for other things. And nothing could be further from the truth. These polyunsaturated fatty acids are terrible for fuel. Even if we get them in a good form, they are still very prone to get oxidized and create free radicals. But when we get them from these commercial oils, now they're already destroyed before we ever get to them. So what we need to understand is we need very small amounts of high quality fish oil and other sources of EPA and DHA for structural components. We can integrate these into our cell membranes. That's absolutely essential. But when it comes to energy, when it comes to calories, when it comes to making energy from fuel, from fat, the kind that we need is saturated fat 
and monounsaturated fats. And those are from extra virgin olive oil. So from olives, they are about 70, 80% monounsaturated fats. Avocado is about the same, mostly monounsaturated fats. And animal fats are about half each. They're about 50-50 of saturated fat and monounsaturated fats. And these are the ideal fats for us to make fuel from. Fat is the preferred fuel for the human body. It burns clean, it burns steady, and it burns for a long time. But for fuel, we want the saturated, monounsaturated. For structural components, we want the EPA and the DHA. And we never want to eat more than an occasional smidgen of these so-called vegetable oils. And if you want to lose belly fat, you never want to ignore obesogens. And what are those? Those are things that make you obese. That's just what the word says. But they are also known as endocrine disruptors. And endocrine means hormone. That's the very delicate, extremely delicate and well-balanced system that you have in your body. It's supervised by your hypothalamus and your pituitary and your brain. And we're talking nanograms, picograms. We're talking infinitely small amounts of these hormones. But the problem is that there are things in our environment, such as exogenous hormones, hormones added to animal feed or other chemicals acting as hormones that will disrupt our own hormone, our own endocrine system. So if there's a receptor that's supposed to hold one of your hormones, and now we plug that receptor with something else, now your nervous system, your hormonal system, cannot communicate the way that it's supposed to. So we can find some of these chemicals, some of these endocrine disruptors in makeup, for example. We can find it in soap. We can find it in plastics. And this is a huge topic, so I'm not even going to try to cover this, but do a quick Google search on endocrine disruptors and obesogens and just find out what the most common ones are. And it's not something that you're probably going to turn around on a dime, but over time, if you can clean up your household and your environment and figure out some of the most common ones, you could probably do yourself some favors. And if you wanna lose that belly fat, you should never ignore chronic stress. And I talk about this a lot, and a lot of people say, yeah, 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 but very few people really truly understand how important stress is. And we need to understand there's two types of stress. There's eustress, which means good stress, and that's very brief stress. Then we have distress, which is chronic. So the good stress, that's gravity, that is exercise, that is hot and cold weather, that's jumping in ice water, that's holding your breath. All of these things that you can do to stress your body, to challenge your body a little bit for a very brief period and then allow the body to relax, those are things that grow your body, that allows your body to adapt and get better and get healthier. But distress is when we have something that creates a new baseline, a, a level of stress that's always there and never goes away, like worry and anger and irritability and worrying about the news and the bills and rude people. And it used to be tens of thousands of years ago as part of nature, we had a good amount of eustress, of good stress. We walked a lot, we moved physically, we might encounter a fight, we might get chased by an animal, but these were all very brief and that's very healthy, that allows us to get better. But today we have less of the brief stress, of the intense short-term stress, but we have a lot of this chronic stress. And I've done other videos on this, so check those out for more detail. But the thing to understand is that whether it is eustress or distress, all kinds of stress will stimulate your fight-flight nervous system and you will 
release cortisol to try to get more emergency fuel. And with that cortisol, you raise blood sugar and then you raise insulin, which we've just talked about. And if this happens for a short term, then that's a good thing. If you have an animal chasing you, then you're going to raise your blood sugar, raise your cortisol, you get in fight flight, and you burn off that extra blood sugar. There's a purpose for that blood sugar and you use it up. But with chronic stress, you're sitting there in your chair and you're fretting and you're worrying and you get cold hands and fingers and your blood pressure goes up and you increase your cortisol but you never burn it off. It's just always chronically a little bit high. So now that increased cortisol and increased blood sugar becomes very destructive instead of serving a short-term purpose. Now on that note, also realize that there's a medication called corticosteroids that basically does the exact same thing to the body that what we just talked about. It increases your fight-flight system, it increases your insulin levels, it basically induces a state of chronic stress in the body. So if you have been prescribed a corticosteroid, make sure that you understand why or talk to your doctor about why. Make sure that it's not just something that you could address another way. Tens of thousands of people every year are given corticosteroids for some ache or pain or inflammation, maybe an inflamed joint, and now this steroid instead gives them diabetes. It helps a little bit with some pain, but instead it gives them type 2 diabetes. So make sure you don't take it more than you have to, you don't take it longer than you have to, and do whatever you can to learn and find out if there's another way that you can address this problem without the steroid. And you also never want to miss sleep. Now everyone's going to lose a few hours here and there. That's not going to dramatically ruin your life. But make sure that you don't always fall short a few hours. Make sure that you get enough sleep and it's quality sleep to where you wake up rested because otherwise if you're always short on sleep then that also creates a state of stress of higher cortisol levels and a level of fight flight. To lose belly fat you never want to be sedentary and to some degree when people talk about exercise or moving they usually talk about calories and it's not completely unimportant but it's a relatively small piece that yes you will burn a few calories when you move, but that's not really going to undo your whole metabolic issue. The main thing that you benefit from is that movement will increase the stimulation. It will drive your frontal lobe of your brain. And when you increase the activity of the frontal lobe, you will turn off stress. You will allow your body to get into a relaxed state. So that's why one of the most common things people get recommended for stress is to go and move, get do some exercise. And it's not just that you change your state of mind, that you break a pattern, it's that you activate, you build up the physical strength of your frontal lobe and now the frontal lobe can do all the things that it's supposed to do and regulate and balance you out and turn off that stress. And then make sure you never ignore your gut health. So much that is tied into that function, specifically to the microbiome, which is the quantity and quality and balance of microbes in your intestine. Because that's been tied more and more into your metabolic function, to insulin resistance, to immunity, to brain function, to cravings and your mental state. So a lot of times when you feel bad, it could be that you have an unbalanced microbiome. If you have too many lipopolysaccharides or LPSs, you could experience anxiety or depression. And even your cravings for sugar and various things could actually be cravings from the bacteria in your gut because if they have cravings and they send out the same type of chemical messengers that give you cravings then you get the cravings and 
they get the sugar. So again, gut health is a huge, huge topic, but some of the things you can start to do is to make sure you get enough prebiotic fiber. So prebiotic means that it feeds this microbiome, that there's a type of fiber, and you find this in a lot of different foods, but that's just what the word means, prebiotic, that it feeds these. And then you can start creating a richer microbiome with more variety and a larger quantity of beneficial bacteria. Of course, if you don't have a whole lot of bacteria to start with, you want to start with probiotics and also fermented foods. But the way to maintain it is to get enough fiber and a wide variety of fiber. And of course, what you want to avoid that created the imbalance of the problem in the first place are things like sugar and stress and antibiotics and man-made chemicals. So you can see how everything ties together that all the things that we talk about that hurt us they also hurt your biome and then an unbalanced gut hurts us further. So which one of all these things that we talked about is the most important one? Well, there's no such thing because it's going to differ for each individual. So for some people, if you can just do three of these, avoid three of these things and you get your results, then great. But if you have a long history of trying things and you haven't gotten the results that you wanted, then chances are that there's one of these things that you're still doing. And the more stubborn your body is, the more you want to make sure that you cover the entire list. So the one that's creating the problem is probably the one that you haven't addressed yet. If you enjoyed this video, you're gonna love that one. And if you truly wanna master health by understanding how the body really works, make sure you subscribe, hit that bell, and turn on all the notifications so you never miss a life-saving video.